I'm just to introduce our speakers. I don't want to delay that. We're a few minutes uh, behind schedule. So let me just tell you, we've got uh, uh, Professor Sir Robert Leckler, um, King's Health Partners, and also on the board of directors of the Crick Institute. Uh, so that's our first speaker, um, and I am probably not going to say too much more at this stage. Uh, his talk is certainly going to be of great interest to everyone. It's an introduction, and we're going to cover quite a few topics, so perhaps I should get us started. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed, and, and thank you for the invitation to participate in uh, what looks like a really fascinating uh, day of discussions about innovation. My task, as I see it, fundamentally is to perturb your postprandial slumber period, and while all the blood's going to your stomach, to try and get some to go to your brain. So I'll do my best. I shall watch your heads and just see whether I'm uh, succeeding. But... Could I ask you to reflect for a moment on, on the evolution of modern medicine as we currently enjoy it? Just think back um, to Pasteur, um, who's really the father of microbiology, Fleming, penicillin, uh, Jenner, who discovered that exposure to cowpox protected you from smallpox. That was the beginning of vaccines. Lister, professor of surgery at King's College, uh, who discovered antisepsis protected you from post-operative infections. Really seminal discoveries. But the point is that it was at a very gentlemanly pace. These discoveries came decades apart. And it ain't like that now. And that's really the message I'm going to drive home. But even in our lifetimes, think about what's happened. So HIV AIDS, now you can live with for a long time. Uh, cancer one can talk about as a long-term condition. Some cancers are curable. You're going to hear about something uh, about that from Andrew, I think, in a moment. Um, transplantation, my own field. If your kidney or your liver or your heart or your lung failed uh, up until the sort of halfway through the last century, you were dead. There was no question about it. Now, organ transplantation has completely transformed that, uh, and you can live. So that's exciting, but what I'm suggesting today, uh, this afternoon, is that we are entering uh, a biomedical revolution, and healthcare is going to change uh, beyond recognition uh, in the next couple of decades, in some ways that we can predict, but I'm quite sure in some ways that we can't. And I'm going to illustrate that uh, with three superficial mentions of uh, relevant areas that I think are going to change. Uh, the first one I'm sure you've heard a lot about and thought a lot about and probably know a lot about. Uh, precision medicine, also known as personalized medicine, also known as stratified medicine, it's fundamentally the same thing. And it depends on what I'm referring to as panomics, and I'll explain that term in a moment. So the first omics was, of course, genomics. And the first human genome uh, was a very important step uh, in the uh, genomic and genetic revolution. That was 2003. Sequencing the first human genome took five years and cost $3 billion. Uh, and over the last decade, this is what's happened to the cost of sequencing a human genome. This is 100 million uh, falling. And then when new generation sequencing came in, it dropped precipitously. And so 2013, about $5,000 to sequence a human genome. Now you can do a human genome in a day at the cost of around $1,000. And that may well come down. Now, what a dramatic, dramatic pace uh, of change that has been. And so, of course, not surprisingly, that's led to a, an exponential rise in the number of novel disease-causing genes that have been identified. Now, it's difficult to keep pace with that because we don't know what the function of all the genes are uh, that are disease-associated. But that is going to radically change the way that we understand disease. And so it's embarrassing to admit that modern medicine, modern medicine still categorizes too many diseases by their symptomatology. So epilepsy, that's not a diagnosis. That's people who have fits. Asthma is not really a diagnosis. It's people who wheeze. And so I think that this uh, advance of what I'm calling panomics, so that's genomics, epigenomics, which of course determines which genes are expressed, metabolomics, uh, proteomics, 
Uh, exposomics, that's what the, the environment that you are exposed to and its influence uh, on your physiology. Those things are going to lead to an unpicking of the molecular pathogenesis of many common diseases so that they won't be common diseases anymore. There'll be a collection of rare diseases. And so the implications of that for drug discovery, I think, are quite challenging. And so in terms of therapy, what this means is that patients then will be rationally put into a variety of categories. Uh, the one you want to be in is uh, where a drug is going to work and it's not going to be toxic. Uh, it may be that the drug's toxic and not beneficial, not toxic, not beneficial, toxic and beneficial. So that's what precision medicine is about. And it's overhyped, like most developments in medicine, because we're not there yet. It's working in cancer to a degree, but not many other places. But I do think it's going to happen, and it's going to radically change uh, the way that medicine uh, is delivered. The second revolution is regenerative medicine. So I talked about organ transplantation. That's my own field, and it has been a fantastic advance. But it's a rather crude thing to do, to take a kidney out of one person and put it into another. I think our, uh, our descendants will look back on this as a rather barbaric thing, living donor transplantation especially. Um, now, regenerative medicine refers to the possibility that is beginning to emerge that tissues that are damaged and can't repair themselves very well, and that applies to quite a lot of tissues, the liver, I don't know whether you had an alcoholic lunch or not, the liver is quite good at repairing itself, and that's a very good news for many of us. Uh, the kidney doesn't. The brain and the central nervous system uh, doesn't. The heart, the myocardium, doesn't either. So regenerative medicine offers the promise that damaged tissues can be uh, repaired and replaced. And some very exciting things happening in this field. This is uh, extremely recent. You might have actually caught this on the news. This is the work from Doug Melton's lab in Boston, uh, achieving something that there's only been faltering success to date, and that is generating pancreatic beta cells from human stem cells. This green staining here is insulin staining. These are clusters of insulin-producing cells, human, and this is exactly what you need if we're going to be able to treat diabetes, which is essentially a failure one diabetes, a failure uh, of the beta cells, the destruction of the immune system. So that's just one example, but there are many other very uh, promising examples uh, coming down the line. Here's another one that was published quite recently. This is a kidney organoid generated from a fecal stem cell, growing mini kidneys. These are able to make urine. This actually is in a mouse. I, uh, it's not yet been done in a human, but there's every reason to think that that kind of technology will creep into the human arena and address the biggest problem related to organ transplantation, which is the lack of supply and its inability to keep up with demand. Now, there are problems with regenerative medicine, of course. Uh, if, the, if the, the tissue comes from stem cells from another individual, then you have to regard it as another kind of transplant and deal with the immune response. But uh, my own group and many others, are, I hope, will be able to address that. There's the risk of cancer arising from a stem cell if it isn't fully differentiated. And we need to be sure that these cells are going to be stable in their function. Uh, and, of course, then there's the scale-up to make this really commercially doable. But all these issues, I'm confident, can be tackled, and I think it will change the face of medicine. Uh, the third area to touch on, I wanted to touch on, is the digital revolution. Medicine has been horribly slow to keep pace with the digital revolution. I, you may have observed that. So it's completely transformed the way that travel is managed. It's transformed the way communication is managed. It's transformed the way that retailing is managed. Uh, every day, almost, someone comes to knock at our door with a package from Amazon that the kid, my kids have ordered something else without permission. So you know, the whole retail industry is absolutely transformed. Uh, medicine has yet to be transformed by the digital revolution, but it will be. And so I'm sure nobody would care to own up to being in a hospital that had a medical records department that looked like that. But I have seen things that look rather like that. Uh, they will be no more. And so the digital revolution is going to change a lot of things. And there are many examples. So one is, is long-term uh, telemetry EEG uh, of someone who's going to have surgery to deal with their severe epilepsy to give precise mapping as to where the surgical intervention needs to happen. Uh, schizophrenia, there's an app now to monitor symptoms in psychotics when they're living at home in the community so they don't need to be all hospital-based and then you can intervene promptly when necessary. Activity monitoring, very important in public health, particularly in kids. 
Exposure monitoring, if you've got someone who's got bad asthma uh, and you can monitor when they're exposed to environmental triggers, then you can intervene to prevent an exacerbation. And of course, remote cons consultation and diagnosis. The hospital will become a much less populated place uh, as telemedicine uh, and remote uh, monitoring takes over. Another example is uh, real-time visualization of brain activity, which is becoming ever more possible. Um, and there's a remarkable development where patients can actually start to train themselves in response to them visualizing through scanning their own brain activity in a way that can improve their mood. And I think that's a very interesting piece of potential uh, development. Uh, cancer surgery in the eye knife. So now as a surgeon is operating, they can sample the tumor as they're cutting it. That can then be analyzed in real time, and then you know how far to cut, essentially, in crude terms. So that kind of technology, again, is advancing. Uh, and lastly, image-guided surgery, and, and we're doing some of that in, in one of my hospitals, but it's going on all over the place in all sorts of ways to give much more precise uh, information to those that are putting knives into your body. So I think this is a very exciting time. I think we are going to participate in this revolution. I think medicine will change, as I say, beyond recognition and very much for the better. But we're going to have to run uh, to keep up with the pace of change. Now, I was asked to say something um, about MedCity, with which I am involved. Uh, and so let me close by doing that. The drive for MedCity, which is all about innovation, um, uh, was a recognition of the riches that London has. And I don't know, I'm sure many of you are from outside London, but if you'll allow me to indulge myself and my London colleagues for a moment, London has huge riches. So it has three of the world's top 30 universities. Uh, all three of those universities are linked to three of the UK's six academic health sciences centres, which puts some of the best hospitals together with their biomedicine research university partners. Uh, our chairman referred to the Francis Crick Institute. This is an extremely exciting development, in my view. It's uh, built now behind St Pancras Station. It'll be a world-class discovery science institute with conduits for translation because of these three partnerships. We are all, all three full partners in the Crick, and so we have our communities of clinicians and infrastructure for experimental medicine so that discovery can get into patients quickly. Um, there's lots of investment in experimental medicine facilities through NIHR. The regulators are in London. The patient uh, that we have access to are to die for if you want to do clinical trials and patient-based research. <laughs> so London has substantial riches, but London has not been capitalizing on those riches. And so we asked McKinsey to do a piece of work uh, for us recently. And they compared London to Boston and San Francisco, two other major biomedical capitals, Boston perhaps being the king capital. If you compare London to Boston, we are producing the same number of papers as Boston almost exactly. Are we publishing poor papers? No, we're not, because the citation index is very similar between London and Boston. But the number of patents filed, you can see, is dramatically different. And the number of early phase trials is significantly lower, which is an embarrassment given the patient population we have. And finally, the commercial investment from external commercial partners is less than 10% of that in Boston. And so that's what led, triggered the formation of MedCity, uh, and it's designed to bring together all those riches I've described to create a, a, a single portal for commercial partners to, entry, to enter, have a concierge service to navigate around, and therefore to engage in wealth generation linked to innovation. So my final slide, uh, this fragmented uh, landscape that we have, we need to bring together in order to extract value, and that will mean bringing researchers, users of research, patients, commercial partners, and the public together to make sure that our, impact, our innovation has real impact. Thanks a lot. Thank you.